This book is published by RNIB. One Hundred Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Read by Patrick Romer, it lasts sixteen hours and forty one minutes. Here's a brief description of the book. A saga spanning three generations of the Buendia family. Jose Buendia founds a farm in the heart of the South American jungle, and the family is dominated by his passion for alchemy. But the world is changing, and succeeding generations are caught up in political and social turmoil. This book has been digitally remastered from RNIB's audio archive. This book is on one structured CD. This book has been recorded in Daisy and has one level of navigation to indicate the start of each chapter. This book was published by Cape in 1972. This copy has been made under a CLA license for the use of visually impaired people and may not be copied, including any electronic copying or transmission. Copyright in this recording vests in RNIB. One Hundred Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. At that time, Macondo was a village of twenty adobe houses, built on the bank of a river of clear water that ran along a bed of polished stones, which were white and enormous, like prehistoric eggs. The world was so recent that many things lacked names, and in order to indicate them it was necessary to point. Every year, during the month of March, a family of ragged gypsies would set up their tents near the village, and with a great uproar of pipes and kettle drums, they would display new inventions. First, they brought the magnet. A heavy gypsy with an untamed beard and sparrow hands, who introduced himself as Melchiadesh, put on a bold public demonstration of what he himself called the eighth wonder of the learned alchemists of Macedonia. He went from house to house, dragging two metal ingots, and everybody was amazed to see pots, pans, tongs and braziers tumble down from their places, and beams creak from the desperation of nails and screws trying to emerge, and even objects that had been lost for a long time appeared from where they had been searched for most, and went dragging along in turbulent confusion behind Melchiadesh magical irons. Things have a life of their own, the gypsy proclaimed with a harsh accent. It's simply a matter of waking up their souls. José Arcadio Buendía, whose unbridled imagination always went beyond the genius of nature, and even beyond miracles and magic, thought that it would be possible to make use of that useless invention to extract gold from the bowels of the earth. Melchiadesh, who was an honest man, warned him, it won't work for that. But Jose Arcadio Buendia, at that time, did not believe in the honesty of gypsies. So he traded his mule and a pair of goats for the two magnetized ingots. Ursula Iguaran, his wife, who relied on those animals to increase their poor domestic holdings, was unable to dissuade him. Very soon we'll have gold enough and more to pave the floors of the house her husband replied. For several months he worked hard to demonstrate the truth of his idea. He explored every inch of the region, even the riverbed, dragging the two iron ingots along and reciting Melchiadesh incandation aloud. 
The only thing he succeeded in doing was to unearth a suit of 15th century armour, which had all of its pieces soldered together with rust, and inside of which there was the hollow resonance of an enormous stone-filled gourd. When José Arcadio Buendía and the four men of his expedition managed to take the armour apart, they found inside a calcified skeleton with a copper locket containing a woman's hair around its neck. In March, the gypsies returned. This time, they brought a telescope and a magnifying glass the size of a drum, which they exhibited as the latest discovery of the Jews of Amsterdam. They placed a gypsy woman at one end of the village and set up the telescope at the entrance to the tent. For the price of five reals, people could look into the telescope and see the gypsy woman an arm's length away. Science has eliminated distance, Melchiadesh proclaimed. In a short time, man will be able to see what is happening in any place in the world without leaving his own house. A burning noonday sun brought out a startling demonstration with the gigantic magnifying glass. They put a pile of dry hay in the middle of the street and set it on fire by concentrating the sun's rays. José Arcadio Buendía, who had still not been consoled for the failure of his magnets, conceived the idea of using that invention as a weapon of war. Again, Melchiades tried to dissuade him. But he finally accepted the two magnetized ingots and three colonial coins in exchange for the magnifying glass. Ursula wept in consternation. That money was from a chest of gold coins that her father had put together over an entire life of privation and that she had buried underneath her bed in hopes of a proper occasion to make use of it. José Arcadio Buendía made no attempt to console her, completely absorbed in his tactical experiments with the abnegation of a scientist and even at the risk of his own life. In an attempt to show the effects of the glass on enemy troops, he exposed himself to the concentration of the sun's rays and suffered burns which turned into sores that took a long time to heal. Over the protests of his wife, who was alarmed at such a dangerous invention, at one point he was ready to set the house on fire. He would spend hours on end in his room, calculating the strategic possibilities of his novel weapon, until he succeeded in putting together a manual of startling instructional clarity and an irresistible power of conviction. He sent it to the government, accompanied by numerous descriptions of his experiments and several pages of explanatory sketches, by a messenger who crossed the mountains, got lost in measureless swamps, forded stormy rivers, and was on the point of perishing under the lash of despair, plague and wild beasts, until he found a route that joined the one used by the mules that carried the mail. In spite of the fact that a trip to the capital was little less than impossible at that time, José Arcadio Buendía promised to undertake it as soon as the government ordered him to, so that he could put on some practical demonstrations of his invention for the military authorities, and could train them himself in the complicated art of solar war. For several years, he waited for an answer. Finally, tired of waiting, he bemoaned to Melchiades the failure of his project, and the gypsy then gave him a convincing proof of his honesty. He gave him back the doubloons in exchange for the magnifying glass, and he left him, in addition, some Portuguese maps and several instruments of navigation. In his own handwriting, he set down a concise synthesis of the studies by Monk Hermann, which he left José Arcadio, so that he would be able to make use of the astrolabe, the compass, and the sextant. José Arcadio Buendía spent the long months of the rainy season shut up in a small room that he had built in the rear of the house, so that no one would disturb his experiments. Having completely abandoned his domestic obligations, he spent entire nights in the courtyard watching the course of the stars 
and he almost contracted sunstroke from trying to establish an exact method of ascertaining noon. When he became an expert in the use and manipulation of his instruments, he conceived a notion of space that allowed him to navigate across unknown seas, to visit uninhabited territories, and to establish relations with splendid beings without having to leave his study. That was the period in which he acquired the habit of talking to himself, of walking through the house without paying attention to anyone, as Ursula and the children broke their backs in the garden, growing banana and caladium, cassava and yams, ahuyama roots and eggplants. Suddenly, without warning, his feverish activity was interrupted and was replaced by a kind of fascination. He spent several days as if he were bewitched, softly repeating to himself a string of fearful conjectures, without giving credit to his own understanding. Finally, one Tuesday in December, at lunchtime, all at once he released the whole weight of his torment. The children would remember for the rest of their lives the august solemnity with which their father, devastated by his prolonged vigil and by the wrath of his imagination, revealed his discovery to them. The earth is round, like an orange. Ursula lost her patience. If you have to go crazy, please go crazy all by yourself, she shouted. But don't try to put your gypsy ideas into the heads of the children. José Arcadio Buendía, impassive, did not let himself be frightened by the desperation of his wife, who, in a seizure of rage, smashed the astrolabe against the floor. He built another one. He gathered the men of the village in his little room, and he demonstrated to them, with theories that none of them could understand, the possibility of returning to where one had set out by consistently sailing east. The whole village was convinced that José Arcadio Buendía had lost his reason when Melchiades returned to set things straight. He gave public praise to the intelligence of a man who, from pure astronomical speculation, had evolved a theory that had already been proved in practice, although unknown in Macondo until then. And as a proof of his admiration, he made him a gift that was to have a profound influence on the future of the village, the laboratory of an alchemist. By then, Melchiades had aged with surprising rapidity. On his first trips, he seemed to be the same age as José Arcadio Buendía. But while the latter had preserved his extraordinary strength, which permitted him to pull down a horse by grabbing its ears, the gypsy seemed to have been worn down by some tenacious illness. It was, in reality, the result of multiple and rare diseases contracted on his innumerable trips around the world. According to what he himself said as he spoke to José Arcadio Buendía while helping him to set up the laboratory, death followed him everywhere, sniffing at the cuffs of his pants, but never deciding to give him the final clutch of its claws. He was a fugitive from all the plagues and catastrophes that had ever lashed mankind. He had survived Pelagra in Persia, scurvy in the Malayan archipelago, leprosy in Alexandria, beriberi in Japan, bubonic plague in Madagascar, an earthquake in Sicily, and a disastrous shipwreck in the Strait of Magellan. That prodigious creature, said to possess the keys of Nostradamus, was a gloomy man, enveloped in a sad aura, with an Asiatic look that seemed to know what there was on the other side of things. He wore a large black hat that looked like a raven with widespread wings, and a velvet vest across which the patterner of the centuries had skated. But in spite of his immense wisdom and his mysterious breadth, he had a human burden, an earthly condition that kept him involved in the small problems of daily life. He would complain of the ailments of old age. He suffered from the most insignificant economic difficulties. And he had stopped laughing a long time back 
because scurvy had made his teeth drop out. On that suffocating noontime, when the gypsy revealed his secrets, José Arcadio Buendía had the certainty that it was the beginning of a great friendship. The children were startled by his fantastic stories. Aureliano, who could not have been more than five at the time, would remember him for the rest of his life as he saw him that afternoon, sitting against the metallic and quivering light from the window, lighting up with his deep organ voice the darkest reaches of the imagination, while down over his temples there flowed the grease that was being melted by the heat. José Arcadio, his older brother, would pass on that wonderful image as a hereditary memory to all of his descendants. Ursula, on the other hand, held a bad memory of that visit, for she had entered the room just as Melchiades had carelessly broken a flask of bichloride of mercury. Ah, it's the smell of the devil, she said. Not at all, Melchiades corrected her. It has been proven that the devil has sulfuric properties, and this is just a little corrosive sublimate. Always didactic, he went into a learned exposition of the diabolical properties of cinnabar. But Ursula paid no attention to him, although she took the children off to pray. That biting odour would stay forever in her mind, linked to the memory of Melchiades. The rudimentary laboratory, in addition to a profusion of pots, funnels, retorts, filters and sieves, was made up of a primitive water pipe, a glass beaker with a long, thin neck, a reproduction of the philosopher's egg, and a still the gypsies themselves had built in accordance with modern descriptions of the three-armed alembic of Mary the Jew. Along with those items, Melchiades left samples of the seven metals that corresponded to the seven planets, the formulas of Moses and Zosimus for doubling the quantity of gold, and a set of notes and sketches concerning the processes of the great teaching that would permit those who could interpret them to undertake the manufacture of the philosopher's stone. Seduced by the simplicity of the formulas to double the quantity of gold, José Arcadio Buendía paid court to Ursula for several weeks so that she would let him dig up her colonial coins and increase them by as many times as it was possible to subdivide mercury. Ursula gave in, as always, to her husband's unyielding obstinacy. Then José Arcadio Buendía threw three doubloons into a pan and fused them with copper filings, orpiment, brimstone and lead. He put it all to boil in a pot of castor oil until he got a thick and pestilential syrup, which was more like common caramel than valuable gold. In risky and desperate processes of distillation, melted with the seven planetary metals, mixed with hermetic mercury and vitriol of cypress, and put back to cook in hog fat, for lack of any radish oil, Ursula's precious inheritance was reduced to a large piece of burnt hog cracklings that was firmly stuck to the bottom of the pot. When the gypsies came back, Ursula had turned the whole population of the village against them. But curiosity was greater than fear. For that time, the gypsies went about the town making a deafening noise with all manner of musical instruments, while a hawker announced the exhibition of the most fabulous discovery of the Nassianzanese so that everyone went to the tent, and by paying one cent, they saw a youthful Melchiades, recovered, unwrinkled, with a new and flashing set of teeth. Those who remembered his guns that had been destroyed by scurvy, his flaccid cheeks and his withered lips, trembled with fear at the final proof of the gypsy's supernatural power. The fear turned into panic, when Melchiades took out his teeth, intact, encased in their gums, and showed them to the audience for an instant, 
a fleeting instant in which he went back to being the same decrepit man of years past, and put them back again, and smiled once more with the full control of his restored youth. Even José Arcadio Buendía himself considered that Melchiadesh knowledge had reached unbearable extremes, but he felt a healthy excitement when the gypsy explained to him alone the workings of his false teeth. It seemed so simple and so prodigious at the same time that overnight he lost all interest in his experiments in alchemy. He underwent a new crisis of bad humour. He did not go back to eating regularly, and he would spend the day walking through the house. Incredible things are happening in the world, he said to Ursula. Right across the river, there are all kinds of magical instruments, while we keep on living like donkeys. Those who had known him since the foundation of Makondo were startled at how much he had changed under Melchiadesh influence. At first, José Arcadio Buendía had been a kind of youthful patriarch who would give instructions for planting and advice for the raising of children and animals and who collaborated with everyone, even in the physical work, for the welfare of the community. Since his house from the very first had been the best in the village, the others had been built in its image and likeness. It had a small, well-lighted living room, a dining room in the shape of a terrace with gaily coloured flowers, two bedrooms, a courtyard with a gigantic chestnut tree, a well-kept garden, and a corral where goats, pigs and hens lived in peaceful communion. The only animals that were prohibited, not just in his house but in the entire settlement, were fighting cocks. Ursula's capacity for work was the same as that of her husband. Active, small, severe, that woman of unbreakable nerves, who at no moment in her life had been heard to sing, seemed to be everywhere, from dawn until quite late at night, always pursued by the soft whispering of her stiff, starched petticoats. Thanks to her, the floors of tamped earth the unwhitewashed mud walls, the rustic wooden furniture they had built themselves, were always clean, and the old chests where they kept their clothes exhaled the warm smell of basil. José Arcadio Buendía, who was the most enterprising man ever to be seen in a village, had set up the placement of the houses in such a way that from all of them one could reach the river and draw water with the same effort and he had lined up the streets with such good sense that no house got more sun than another during the hot time of day. Within a few years, Macondo was a village that was more orderly and hard-working than any known until then by its three hundred inhabitants. It was a truly happy village, where no one was over thirty years of age, and where no one had died. Since the time of its founding, José Arcadio Buendía had built traps and cages. In a short time he filled not only his own house, but all of those in the village with troupials, canaries, bee-eaters and red-breasts. The concert of so many different birds became so disturbing that Ursula would plug her ears with beeswax so as not to lose her sense of reality. The first time that Melchiadesh tribe arrived, selling glass balls for headaches, everyone was surprised that they had been able to find that village lost in the drowsiness of the swamp, and the gypsies confessed that they had found their way by the song of the birds. That spirit of social initiative disappeared in a short time, pulled away by the fever of the magnets, the astronomical calculations the dreams of transmutation, and the urge to discover the wonders of the world. From a clean and active man, José Arcadio Buendía changed into a man lazy in appearance, careless in his dress, with a wild beard that Ursula managed to trim with great effort, and a kitchen knife. There were many who considered him the victim of some strange spell, but even those most convinced of his madness 
left work and family, to follow him when he brought out his tools to clear the land, and asked the assembled group to open a way that would put Macondo in contact with the great inventions. José Arcardia Buendía was completely ignorant of the geography of the region. He knew that to the east there lay an impenetrable mountain chain, and that on the other side of the mountains there was the ancient city of Rio Hacha, where, in times past, according to what he had been told by the first Aureliano Buendía, his grandfather, Sir Francis Drake had gone crocodile hunting with cannons, and that he repaired them and stuffed them with straw to bring to Queen Elizabeth. In his youth, José Arcardio Buendía and his men, with wives and children, animals and all kinds of domestic implements, had crossed the mountains in search of an outlet to the sea, and after twenty-six months they gave up the expedition and founded Macondo, so they would not have to go back. It was, therefore, a route that did not interest him, for it could only lead to the past. To the south lay the swamps, covered with an eternal vegetable scum, and the whole vast universe of the great swamp, which, according to what the gypsies said, had no limits. The great swamp in the west mingled with a boundless extension of water, where there were soft-skinned cetaceans that had the head and torso of a woman, causing the ruination of sailors with the charm of their extraordinary breasts. The gypsies sailed along that route for six months before they reached the strip of land over which the mules that carried the mail passed. According to José Arcardio Buendía's calculations, the only possibility of contact with civilization lay along the northern route. So he handed out clearing tools and hunting weapons to the same men who had been with him during the founding of Macondo. He threw his directional instruments and his maps into a knapsack, and he undertook the reckless adventure. During the first days, they didn't come across any appreciable obstacle. They went down along the stony bank of the river to the place where, years before, they had found the soldier's armour. And from there, they went into the woods along a path between wild orange trees. At the end of the first week, they killed and roasted a deer, but they agreed to eat only half of it and salt the rest for the days that lay ahead. With that precaution, they tried to postpone the necessity for having to eat macaws, whose blue flesh had a harsh and musky taste. Then, for more than ten days, they did not see the sun again. The ground became soft and damp, like volcanic ash, and the vegetation was thicker and thicker, and the cries of the birds and the uproar of the monkeys became more and more remote and the world became eternally sad. The men on the expedition felt overwhelmed by their most ancient memories in that paradise of dampness and silence, going back to before original sin, as their boots sank into pools of steaming oil, and their machetes destroyed bloody lilies and golden salamanders. For a week, almost without speaking, they went ahead like sleepwalkers through a universe of grief, lighted only by the tenuous reflection of luminous insects, and their lungs were overwhelmed by a suffocating smell of blood. They could not return, because the strip that they were opening as they went along would soon close up with a new vegetation that almost seemed to grow before their eyes. It's all right, José Arcardio Buendía would say. The main thing is not to lose our bearings. Always following his compass, he kept on guiding his men towards the invisible north so that they would be able to get out of that enchanted region. It was a thick night, starless, but the darkness was becoming impregnated with a fresh and clear air. Exhausted by the long crossing, they hung up their hammocks and slept deeply for the first time in two weeks. When they woke up, with the sun already high in the sky, 
they were speechless with fascination. Before them, surrounded by ferns and palm trees, white and powdery in the silent morning light, was an enormous Spanish galleon. Tilted slightly to the starboard, it had hanging from its intact masts the dirty rags of its sails in the midst of its rigging, which was adorned with orchids. The hull, covered with an armour of petrified barnacles and soft moss, was firmly fastened into a surface of stones. The whole structure seemed to occupy its own space, one of solitude and oblivion, protected from the vices of time and the habits of the birds. Inside, where the expeditionaries explored with careful intent, there was nothing but a thick forest of flowers. The discovery of the galleon, an indication of the proximity of the sea, broke José Arcadio Buendía's drive. He considered it a trick of his whimsical fate to have searched for the sea without finding it, at the cost of countless sacrifices and suffering, and to have found it all of a sudden without looking for it, as it lay across his path like an insurmountable object. Many years later, Colonel Aureliano Buendia crossed the region again, when it was already a regular mail route, and the only part of the ship he found was its burnt-out frame in the midst of a field of poppies. Only then, convinced that the story had not been some product of his father's imagination, did he wonder how the galleon had been able to get inland to that spot. But José Arcadio Buendía did not concern himself with that when he found the sea after another four days' journey from the galleon. His dreams ended as he faced that ashen, foamy, dirty sea, which had not merited the risks and sacrifices of the adventure. God damn it, he shouted. Macondo is surrounded by water on all sides. The idea of a peninsula Macondo prevailed for a long time, inspired by the arbitrary map that José Arcadio Buendía sketched on his return from the expedition. He drew it in rage, evilly, exaggerating the difficulties of communication, as if to punish himself for the absolute lack of sense with which he had chosen the place. We'll never get anywhere, he lamented to Ursula. We're going to rot our lives away here without receiving the benefits of science. That certainty, mulled over for several months in the small room he used as his laboratory, brought him to the conception of the plan to move Macondo to a better place. But that time, Ursula had anticipated his feverish designs. With the secret and implacable labour of a small ant, she predisposed the women of the village against the flightiness of their husbands, who were already preparing for the move. José Arcadio Buendía did not know at what moment or because of what adverse forces his plan had become enveloped in a web of pretexts, disappointments and evasions, until it turned into nothing but an illusion. Ursula watched him with innocent attention, and even felt some pity for him on the morning when she found him in the back room muttering about his plans for moving as he placed his laboratory pieces in their original boxes. She let him finish. She let him nail up the boxes and put his initials on them with an inked brush, without reproaching him. But knowing now that he knew, because she had heard him say so in his soft monologues, that the men of the village would not back him up in his undertaking. Only when he began to take down the door of the room did Ursula dare ask him what he was doing, and he answered with a certain bitterness, Since no one wants to leave... We'll leave all by ourselves. Ursula did not become upset. We will not leave, she said. We will stay here, because we have had a son here. We still have not had a death, he said. A person does not belong to a place until there is someone dead under the ground. Ursula replied with a soft firmness. 
If I have to die for the rest of you to stay here, I will die. José Arcadio Buendía had not thought that his wife's will was so firm. He tried to seduce her with the charm of his fantasy, with the promise of a prodigious world where all one had to do was sprinkle some magic liquid on the ground and the plants would bear fruit whenever a man wished, and where all manner of instruments against pain were sold at bargain prices. But Ursula was insensible to his clairvoyance. Instead of going around thinking about your crazy inventions, you should be worrying about your sons, she replied. Look at the state they're in, running wild, just like donkeys. José Arcadio Buendía took his wife's words literally. He looked out the window and saw the barefoot children in the sunny garden, and he had the impression that only at that instant had they begun to exist, conceived by Ursula's spell. Something occurred inside of him then, something mysterious and definitive that uprooted him from his own time and carried him adrift through an unexplored region of his memory. While Ursula continued sweeping the house, which was safe now from being abandoned for the rest of her life, he stood there with an absorbed look, contemplating the children until his eyes became moist and he dried them with the back of his hand, exhaling a deep sigh of resignation. All right, he said. Tell them to come help me take the things out of the boxes. José Arcadio, the older of the children, was fourteen. He had a square head, thick hair, and his father's character. Although he had the same impulse for growth and physical strength, it was early evident that he lacked imagination. He had been conceived and born during the difficult crossing of the mountains, before the founding of Macondo, and his parents gave thanks to heaven when they saw that he had no animal features. Aureliano, the first human being to be born in Macondo, would be six years old in March. He was silent and withdrawn. He had wept in his mother's womb and had been born with his eyes open. As they were cutting the umbilical cord, he moved his head from side to side, taking in the things in the room and examining the faces of the people with a fearless curiosity. Then, indifferent to those who came close to look at him, he kept his attention concentrated on the palm roof, which looked as if it were about to collapse under the tremendous pressure of the rain. Ursula did not remember the intensity of that look again until one day when little Aureliano, at the age of three, went into the kitchen at the moment she was taking a pot of boiling soup from the stove and putting it on the table. The child, perplexed, said from the doorway, It's going to spill. The pot was firmly placed in the centre of the table, but just as soon as the child had made his announcement, it began an unmistakable movement towards the edge, as if impelled by some inner dynamism, and it fell and broke on the floor. Ursula, alarmed, told her husband about the episode, but he interpreted it as a natural phenomenon. That was the way he always was, alien to the existence of his sons, partly because he considered childhood as a period of mental insufficiency, and partly because he was always too absorbed in his fantastic speculations. But since the afternoon when he called the children in to help him unpack the things in the laboratory, he gave them his best hours. In the small separate room, where the walls were gradually being covered by strange maps and fabulous drawings, he taught them to read and write and do sums, and he spoke to them about the wonders of the world, not only where his learning had extended, but forcing the limits of his imagination to extremes. It was in that way that the boys ended up learning that in the southern extremes of Africa there were men so intelligent and peaceful that their only pastime was to sit and think, 
and that it was possible to cross the Aegean Sea on foot by jumping from island to island all the way to the port of Salonica. Those hallucinating sessions remained printed on the memories of the boys in such a way that many years later, a second before the regular army officer gave the firing squad the command to fire, Colonel Aureliano Buendia saw once more that warm March afternoon on which his father had interrupted the lesson in physics and stood fascinated with his hand in the air and his eyes motionless, listening to the distant pipes, drums and jingles of the gypsies, who were coming to the village once more, announcing the latest and most startling discovery of the sages of Memphis. They were new gypsies, young men and women who knew only their own language, handsome specimens with oily skins and intelligent hands, whose dances and music sowed a panic of uproarious joy through the streets, with parrots painted all colours reciting Italian arias, and a hen who laid a hundred golden eggs to the sound of a tambourine, and a trained monkey who read minds, and the multiple-use machine that could be used at the same time to sew on buttons and reduce fevers, and the apparatus to make a person forget his bad memories, and a poultice to lose time, and a thousand more inventions so ingenious and unusual that José Arcardio Buendía must have wanted to invent a memory machine so that he could remember them all. In an instant, they transformed the village. The inhabitants of Macondo found themselves lost in their own streets, confused by the crowded fair. Holding a child by each hand so as not to lose them in the tumult, bumping into acrobats with gold-capped teeth and jugglers with six arms, suffocated by the mingled breath of manure and sandals that the crowd exhaled, José Arcardio Buendía went about everywhere like a madman, looking for Melchiades, so that he could reveal to him the infinite secrets of that fabulous nightmare. He asked several gypsies, who did not understand his language. Finally, he reached the place where Melchiades used to set up his tent, and he found a taciturn Armenian, who in Spanish was hawking a syrup to make oneself invisible. He had drunk down a glass of the amber substance in one gulp, as José Arcardio Buendía elbowed his way through the absorbed group that was witnessing the spectacle, and was able to ask his question. The gypsy wrapped him in the frightful climate of his look, before he turned into a puddle of pestilential and smoking pitch, over which the echo of his reply still floated, Melchiades is dead. Upset by the news, José Arcardio Buendía stood motionless, trying to rise above his affliction, until the group dispersed, called away by other artifices, and the puddle of the taciturn Armenian evaporated completely. Other gypsies confirmed later on that Melchiades had in fact succumbed to the fever on the beach at Singapore, and that his body had been thrown into the deepest part of the Java Sea. The children had no interest in the news. They insisted that their father take them to see the overwhelming novelty of the sages of Memphis that was being advertised at the entrance of a tent that, according to what was said, had belonged to King Solomon. They insisted so much that José Arcardio Buendía paid the thirty reals and led them into the centre of the tent, where there was a giant with a hairy torso and a shaved head, with a copper ring in his nose and a heavy iron chain on his ankle, watching over a pirate chest. When it was opened by the giant, the chest gave off a glacial exhalation. Inside there was only an enormous, transparent block with infinite internal needles in which the light of the sunset was broken up into coloured stars. Disconcerted, knowing that the children were waiting for an immediate explanation, José Arcardio Buendía ventured a murmur, mm, It's the largest diamond in the world. No, 
the gypsy counted. It's ice. Jose Arcardio Buendia, without understanding, stretched out his hand towards the cake, but the giant moved it away. Five reals more to touch it, he said. Jose Arcardio Buendia paid them and put his hand on the ice and held it there for several minutes as his heart filled with fear and jubilation at the contact with mystery. Without knowing what to say, he paid ten reals more so that his sons could have that prodigious experience. Little Jose Arcardio refused to touch it. Aureliano, on the other hand, took a step forward and put his hand on it, withdrawing it immediately. It's boiling, he exclaimed, startled. But his father paid attention to him. Intoxicated by the evidence of the miracle, he forgot at that moment about the frustration of his delirious undertakings and Melchiadesh's body, abandoned to the appetite of the squids. He paid another five reals, and with his hand on the cake, as if giving testimony on the holy scriptures, he exclaimed, This is the great invention of our time. When the pirate Sir Francis Drake attacked Rio Hacha in the 16th century, Ursula Iguaran's great-great-grandmother became so frightened with the ringing of alarm bells and the firing of cannons that she lost control of her nerves and sat down on a lighted stove. The burns changed her into a useless wife for the rest of her days. She could only sit on one side, cushioned by pillows, and something strange must have happened to her way of walking, for she never walked again in public. She gave up all kinds of social activity, obsessed with the notion that her body gave off a singed odour. Dawn would find her in the courtyard, for she did not dare fall asleep, lest she dream of the English and their ferocious attack dogs as they came through the windows of her bedroom to submit her to shameful tortures with their red-hot irons. Her husband, an Aragonese merchant by whom she had two children, spent half the value of his store on medicines and pastimes in an attempt to alleviate her terror. Finally, he sold the business and took the family to live far from the sea in a settlement of peaceful Indians located in the foothills, where he built his wife a bedroom without windows so that the pirates of her dream would have no way to get in. In that hidden village, there was a native-born tobacco planter who had lived there for some time, Don José Arcadio Buendía, with whom Ursula's great-great-grandfather established a partnership that was so lucrative that within a few years they made a fortune. Several centuries later, the great-great-grandson of the native-born planter married the great-great-granddaughter of the Aragonese. Therefore, every time that Ursula became exercised over her husband's mad ideas, she would leap back over three hundred years of fate and curse the day that Sir Francis Drake had attacked Rio Hacha. It was simply a way of giving herself some relief, because actually they were joined till death by a bond that was more solid than love, a common prick of conscience. They were cousins. They had grown up together in the old village that both of their ancestors, with their work and their good habits, had transformed into one of the finest towns in the province. Although their marriage was predicted from the time they had come into the world, when they expressed their desire to be married, their own relatives tried to stop it. They were afraid that those two healthy products of two races that had interbred over the centuries would suffer the shame of breeding iguanas, there had already been a horrible precedent. An aunt of Ursula's, married to an uncle of José Arcardio Buendía, had a son who went through life wearing loose baggy trousers and who bled to death after having lived 42 years in the purest state of virginity. For he had been born and had grown up with a cartilaginous tail in the shape of a corkscrew and with a small tuft of hair on the tip. A pig's tail, 
that was never allowed to be seen by any woman, and that cost him his life when a butcher friend did him the favour of chopping it off with his cleaver. José Arcardio Buendía, with the whimsy of his nineteen years, resolved the problem with a single phrase. I don't care if I have piglets as long as they can talk. So they were married amidst a festival of fireworks and a brass band that went on for three days. They would have been happy from then on if Ursula's mother had not terrified her with all manner of sinister predictions about their offspring, even to the extreme of advising her to refuse to consummate the marriage. Fearing that her stout and willful husband would rape her while she slept, Ursula, before going to bed, would put on a rudimentary kind of drawers that her mother had made out of sailcloth and had reinforced with a system of criss-crossed leather straps and that was closed in the front by a thick iron buckle. That was how they lived for several months. During the day he would take care of his fighting cocks and she would do frame embroidery with her mother. At night they would wrestle for several hours in an anguished violence that seemed to be a substitute for the act of love, until popular intuition got a whiff of something irregular, and the rumour spread that Ursula was still a virgin a year after her marriage, because her husband was impotent. José Arcardio Buendía was the last one to hear the rumour. Look at what people are going around saying, Ursula, he told his wife very calmly. Let them talk, she said. We know that it's not true. So the situation went on the same way for another six months, until that tragic Sunday when José Arcardio Buendía won a cockfight from Prudencio Aguilar. Furious, aroused by the blood of his bird, the loser backed away from José Arcardio Buendía so that everyone in the cockpit could hear what he was going to tell him. Congratulations, he shouted. Maybe that rooster of yours can do your wife a favour. José Arcardia Buendía serenely picked up his rooster. I'll be right back, he told everyone. And then to Prudencio Aguilar. You go home and get a weapon, because I'm going to kill you. Ten minutes later, he returned with the notched spear that had belonged to his grandfather. At the door to the cockpit, where half the town had gathered, Prudencio Aguilar was waiting for him. There was no time to defend himself. José Arcardio Buendía's spear, thrown with the strength of a bull and with the same good aim with which the first Aureliano Buendía had exterminated the jaguars in the region, pierced his throat. That night, as they held a wake over the corpse in the cockpit, José Arcardio Buendía went into the bedroom as his wife was putting on her chastity pants. Pointing the spear at her, he ordered, Take them off. Ursula had no doubt about her husband's decision. You'll be responsible for what happens, she murmured. José Arcardio Buendía stuck the spear into the dirt floor. If you bear iguanas, we'll raise iguanas, he said. But there'll be no more killings in this town because of you. It was a fine June night, cool and with a moon, and they were awake and frolicking in bed until dawn, indifferent to the breeze that passed through the bedroom, loaded with the weeping of Prudencio Aguilar's kin. The matter was put down as a duel of honour, but both of them were left with a twinge in their conscience. One night, when she could not sleep, Ursula went out into the courtyard to get some water, and she saw Prudencio Aguilar by the water jar. He was livid, a sad expression on his face, trying to cover the hole in his throat with a plug made of esparto grass. It did not bring on fear in her, but pity. She went back to the room and told her husband what she had seen, but he did not think much of it. This just means that we can't stand the weight of our conscience. Two nights later, Ursula saw Prudencio Aguilar again, in the bathroom, 
using the esparto plug to wash the clotted blood from his throat. On another night, she saw him strolling in the rain. José Arcardio Buendía, annoyed by his wife's hallucinations, went out into the courtyard armed with the spear. There was the dead man with his sad expression. You go to hell, José Arcardio Buendía shouted at him. Just as many times as you come back, I'll kill you again. Prudencio Aguilar did not go away, nor did José Arcardio Buendía dare throw the spear. He never slept well after that. He was tormented by the immense desolation with which the dead man had looked at him through the rain, his deep nostalgia as he yearned for living people, the anxiety with which he searched through the house looking for some water with which to soak his esparto plug. Oh, he must be suffering a great deal, he said to Ursula. You can see that he's so very lonely. She was so moved that the next time she saw the dead man uncovering the pots on the stove, she understood what he was looking for, and from then on she placed water jugs all about the house. One night, when he found him washing his wound in his own room, José Arcardio Buendía could no longer resist. It's all right, Prudencio, he told him. We're going to leave this town, just as far away as we can go, and we'll never come back. Go in peace now. That was how they undertook the crossing of the mountains. Several friends of José Arcardio Buendía, young men like him, excited by the adventure, dismantled their houses and packed up, along with their wives and children, to head towards the land that no one had promised them. Before he left, José Arcardio Buendía buried the spear in the courtyard, and one after the other he cut the throats of his magnificent fighting cocks, trusting that in that way he could give some measure of peace to Prudencio Aguilar. All that Ursula took along were a trunk with her bridal clothes, a few household utensils, and the small chest with the gold pieces that she had inherited from her father. They did not lay out any definite itinerary. They simply tried to go in a direction opposite to the road to Rio Hacha, so that they would not leave any trace or meet any people they knew. It was an absurd journey. After fourteen months, her stomach corrupted by monkey meat and snake stew, Ursula gave birth to a son who had all of his features human. She had travelled half of the trip in a hammock that two men carried on their shoulders because swelling had disfigured her legs and her varicose veins had puffed up like bubbles. Although it was pitiful to see them with their sunken stomachs and languid eyes, the children survived the journey better than their parents, and most of the time it was fun for them. One morning, after almost two years of crossing, they became the first mortals to see the western slopes of the mountain range. From the cloudy summit, they saw the immense aquatic expanse of the great swamp as it spread out towards the other side of the world. But they never found the sea. One night... After several months of lost wandering through the swamps, far away now from the last Indians they had met on their way, they camped on the banks of a stony river whose waters were like a torrent of frozen glass. Years later, during the Second Civil War, Colonel Aureliano Buendia tried to follow that same route in order to take Rio Hacha by surprise, and after six days of travelling he understood that it was madness. Nevertheless, the night on which they camped beside the river, his father's host had the look of shipwrecked people with no escape. But their number had grown during the crossing, and they were all prepared, and they succeeded, to die of old age. José Arcardia Buendía dreamed that night that right there a noisy city with houses having mirror walls rose up. He asked what city it was, and they answered him with a name that he had never heard, 
that had no meaning at all, but that had a supernatural echo in his dream. Macondo. On the following day, he convinced his men that they would never find the sea. He ordered them to cut down the trees to make a clearing beside the river, at the coolest spot on the bank, and there they founded the village. José Arcadio Buendía did not succeed in deciphering the dream of houses with mirror walls until the day he discovered ice. Then he thought he understood its deep meaning. He thought that in the near future they would be able to manufacture blocks of ice on a large scale from such a common material as water and with them build the new houses of the village. Macondo would no longer be a burning place where the hinges and door knockers twisted with the heat, but would be changed into a wintry city. If he did not persevere in his attempts to build an ice factory, it was because at that time he was absolutely enthusiastic over the education of his sons, especially that of Aureliano, who from the first had revealed a strange intuition for alchemy. The laboratory had been dusted off, Reviewing Melchiadesh notes, serene now, without the exaltation of novelty, in prolonged and patient sessions they tried to separate Ursula's gold from the debris that was stuck to the bottom of the pot. Young José Arcardio scarcely took part in the process. While his father was involved body and soul with his water pipe, the willful firstborn, who had always been too big for his age, had become a monumental adolescent. His voice had changed. An incipient fuzz appeared on his upper lip. One night, as Ursula went into the room where he was undressing to go to bed, she felt a mingled sense of shame and pity. He was the first man that she had seen naked after her husband, and he was so well equipped for life that he seemed abnormal. Ursula pregnant for the third time, relived her newlywed terror. Around that time, a merry, foul-mouthed, provocative woman came to the house to help with the chores, and she knew how to read the future in cards. Ursula spoke to her about her son. She thought that his disproportionate size was something as unnatural as her cousin's tail of a pig. The woman let out an expansive laugh that resounded through the house like a spray of broken glass. Just the opposite, she said. He'll be very lucky. In order to confirm her prediction, she brought her cards to the house a few days later and locked herself up with José Arcadio in a granary off the kitchen. She calmly placed her cards on an old carpenter's bench, saying anything that came into her head while the boy waited beside her, more bored than intrigued. Suddenly, she reached out her hand and touched him. Lordy, she said, sincerely startled. And that was all she could say. José Arcadio felt his bones filling up with foam, a languid fear and a terrible desire to weep. The woman made no insinuations, but José Arcadio kept looking for her all night long, for the smell of smoke that she had under her armpits and that had got caught under his skin. He wanted to be with her all the time. He wanted her to be his mother, for them never to leave the granary, and for her to say, Lordy, to him. One day he couldn't stand it any more, and he went looking for her at the house. He made a formal visit, sitting uncomprehendingly in the living room without saying a word. At that moment he had no desire for her. He found her different, entirely foreign to the image that her smell brought on, as if she were someone else. He drank his coffee and left the house in depression. That night, during the frightful time of lying awake, he desired her again with a brutal anxiety, but he did not want her that time as she had been in the granary but as she had been that afternoon. Days later, the woman suddenly called him to her house, where she was alone with her mother, 
and she had him come into the bedroom with the pretext of showing him a deck of cards. Then she touched him with such freedom that he suffered a delusion after the initial shudder, and he felt more fear than pleasure. She asked him to come and see her that night. He agreed in order to get away, knowing that he was incapable of going. But that night, in his burning bed, he understood that he had to go to see her, even if he were not capable. He got dressed by feel, listening in the dark to his brother's calm breathing, the dry cough of his father in the next room, the asthma of the hens in the courtyard, the buzz of the mosquitoes, the beating of his heart, and the inordinate bustle of a world that he had not noticed until then. And he went out into the sleeping street. With all his heart he wanted the door to be barred, and not just closed as she had promised him. But it was open. He pushed it with the tips of his fingers, and the hinges yielded with a mournful and articulate moan that left a frozen echo inside of him. From the moment he entered, sideways and trying not to make a noise, he caught the smell. He was still in the hallway, where the woman's three brothers had their hammocks in positions that he could not see, and that he could not determine in the darkness, as he felt his way along the hall to push open the bedroom door, and get his bearings there, so as not to mistake the bed. He found it. He bumped against the ropes of the hammocks, which were lower than he had suspected, and a man who had been snoring until then turned in his sleep and said in a kind of delusion, It was Wednesday. When he pushed open the bedroom door, he could not prevent it from scraping against the uneven floor. Suddenly, in the absolute darkness, he understood with a hopeless nostalgia that he was completely disoriented. Sleeping in the narrow room where the mother, another daughter with her husband and two children, and the woman, who may not have been there. He could have guided himself by the smell, if the smell had not been all over the house, so devious and at the same time so definite as it had always been on his skin. He did not move for a long time, wondering in fright how he had ever got to that abyss of abandonment, when a hand with all its fingers extended and feeling about in the darkness touched his face. He was not surprised, for without knowing he had been expecting it. Then he gave himself over to that hand, and in a terrible state of exhaustion he let himself be led to a shapeless place where his clothes were taken off, and he was heaved about like a sack of potatoes, and thrown from one side to the other in a bottomless darkness in which arms were useless, where it no longer smelled of woman, but of ammonia, and where he tried to remember her face, and found before him the face of Ursula, confusedly aware that he was doing something that for a very long time he had wanted to do, but that he had imagined could never really be done. Not knowing what he was doing, because he did not know where his feet were, or where his head was, or whose feet, or whose head, and feeling that he could no longer resist the glacial rumbling of his kidneys, and the air of his intestines, and fear, and the bewildered anxiety to flee, and at the same time stay forever in that exasperated silence, and that fearful solitude. Her name was Pilar Ternera, she had been part of the exodus that ended with the founding of Macondo, dragged along by her family in order to separate her from the man who had raped her at fourteen and had continued to love her until she was twenty-two, but who never made up his mind to make the situation public because he was a man apart. He promised to follow her to the ends of the earth, but only later on, when he put his affairs in order, and she had become tired of waiting for him, always identifying him with the tall and short, blonde and brunette men that her cards promised from land and sea within three days, three months, or three years. With her waiting she had lost the strength of her thighs, the firmness of her breasts, her habit of tenderness, but she had kept the madness of her heart intact. Maddened by that prodigious plaything, 
Jose Arcadio followed her path every night through the labyrinth of the room. On a certain occasion, he found the door barred, and he knocked several times, knowing that if he had the boldness to knock the first time, he would have had to knock until the last. And after an interminable wait, she opened the door for him. During the day, lying down to dream, he would secretly enjoy the memories of the night before. But when she came into the house, merry, indifferent, chatty, he didn't have to make any effort to hide his tension, because that woman, whose explosive laugh frightened off the doves, had nothing to do with the invisible power that taught him how to breathe from within and control his heartbeats, and that had permitted him to understand why men are afraid of death. He was so wrapped up in himself that he did not even understand the joy of everyone when his father and his brother aroused the household with the news that they had succeeded in penetrating the metallic debris and had separated Ursula's gold. They had succeeded, as a matter of fact, after putting in complicated and persevering days at it. Ursula was happy, and she even gave thanks to God for the invention of alchemy while the people of the village crushed into the laboratory, and they served them guava jelly on crackers to celebrate the wonder. And Jose Arcadio Buendia let them see the crucible with the recovered gold, as if he had just invented it. Showing it all around, he ended up in front of his older son, who, during the past few days, had barely put in an appearance in the laboratory. He put the dry and yellowish mass in front of his eyes and asked him, What does it look like to you? Jose Arcadio answered sincerely, Dog shit. His father gave him a blow with the back of his hand that brought out blood and tears. That night, Pilar Ternera put arnica compresses on the swelling, feeling about for the bottle and cotton in the dark, and she did everything she wanted with him, as long as it did not bother him, making an effort to love him without hurting him. They reached such a state of intimacy that later, without realising it, they were whispering to each other. I want to be alone with you, he said. One of these days I'm going to tell everybody and we can stop all of this sneaking around. She didn't try to calm him down. That will be fine, she said. If we're alone, we'll leave the lamp lighted so that we can see each other and I can holler as much as I want without anybody's having to butt in and you can whisper in my ear any crap you can think of. That conversation, the biting rancour that he felt against his father and the imminent possibility of wild love inspired a serene courage in him. In a spontaneous way, without any preparation, he told everything to his brother. At first, young Aureliano understood only the risk, the immense possibility of danger that his brother's adventures implied, and he could not understand the fascination of the object. Little by little, he became contaminated with the anxiety. He wondered about the details of the dangers. He identified himself with the suffering and enjoyment of his brother. He felt frightened and happy. He would stay awake, waiting for him until dawn in the solitary bed that seemed to have a bottom of live coals, and they would keep on talking until it was time to get up, so that both of them soon suffered from the same drowsiness, felt the same lack of interest in alchemy and the wisdom of their father, and they took refuge in solitude. Those kids are out of their heads, Ursula said. They must have worms. She prepared a repugnant potion for them made out of mashed worm seed, which they both drank with unforeseen stoicism, and they sat down at the same time on their pots eleven times in a single day, expelling some rose-coloured parasites that they showed to everybody with great jubilation, for it allowed them to deceive Ursula as to the origin of their distractions and drowsiness. Aureliano not only understood by them, he also lived his brother's experiences as something of his own. 
For on one occasion, when the latter was explaining in great detail the mechanisms of love, he interrupted him to ask, What does it feel like? Jose Arcadio gave an immediate reply. It's like an earthquake. One January Thursday at two o'clock in the morning, Amaranta was born. Before anyone came into the room, Ursula examined her carefully. She was light and watery, like a newt, but all of her parts were human. Aureliano did not notice the new thing except when the house became full of people. Protected by the confusion, he went off in search of his brother, who had not been in bed since eleven o'clock, and it was such an impulsive decision that he did not even have time to ask himself how he could get him out of Pilar Ternera's bedroom. He circled the house for several hours, whistling private calls, until the proximity of dawn forced him to go home. In his mother's room, playing with the newborn little sister, and with a face that drooped with innocence, he found José Arcadio. Ursula was barely over her forty days' rest when the gypsies returned. They were the same acrobats and jugglers that had brought the ice. Unlike Melchiadesh tribe, they had shown very quickly that they were not heralds of progress, but purveyors of amusement. Even when they brought the ice, they didn't advertise it for its usefulness in the life of man, but as a simple circus curiosity. This time, along with many other artifices, they brought a flying carpet. But they didn't offer it as a fundamental contribution to the development of transport, rather as an object of recreation. The people at once dug up their last gold pieces to take advantage of a quick flight over the houses of the village. Protected by the delightful cover of collective disorder, José Arcadio and Pilar passed many relaxing hours. They were two happy lovers among the crowd, and they even came to suspect that love could be a feeling that was more relaxing and deep than the happiness, wild but momentary, of their secret nights. Pilar, however, broke the spell. Stimulated by the enthusiasm that José Arcadio showed in her companionship, she confused the form and the occasion, and all of a sudden she threw the whole world on top of him. Now you really are a man, she told him. And since he did not understand what she meant, she spelled it out to him. You're going to be a father. Jose Arcadio did not dare leave the house for several days. It was enough for him to hear the rocking laughter of Pilar in the kitchen to run and take refuge in the laboratory, where the artifacts of alchemy had come alive again with Ursula's blessing. Jose Arcadio Buendia received his errant son with joy and initiated him in the search for the philosopher's stone, which he had finally undertaken. One afternoon the boys grew enthusiastic over the flying carpet that went swiftly by the laboratory at window level, carrying the gypsy who was driving it and several children from the village who were merrily waving their hands. But José Arcadio Buendia didn't even look at it. Let them dream, he said. We'll do better flying than they are doing, and with more scientific resources than a miserable bedspread. In spite of his feigned interest, José Arcadio never understood the powers of the philosopher's egg, which to him looked like a poorly blown bottle. He did not succeed in escaping from his worries. He lost his appetite, and he couldn't sleep. He fell into an ill humour, the same as his father's over the failure of his undertakings, and such was his upset that José Arcadio Buendía himself relieved him of his duties in the laboratory, thinking that he had taken alchemy too much to heart. Aureliano, of course, understood that his brother's affliction didn't have its source in the search for the philosopher's stone, but he could not get into his confidence. He had lost his former spontaneity. From an accomplice and a communicative person, he had become withdrawn and hostile. Anxious for solitude, 
bitten by a virulent rancor against the world. One night he left his bed as usual, but he did not go to Pilar Ternero's house, but to mingle in the tumult of the fair. After wandering about among all kinds of contraptions, without becoming interested in any of them, he spotted something that was not a part of it all. A very young gypsy girl, almost a child, who was weighted down by beads and was the most beautiful woman that José Arcadio had ever seen in his life. She was in the crowd that was witnessing the sad spectacle of the man who had been turned into a snake for having disobeyed his parents. José Arcadio paid no attention. While the sad interrogation of the snake man was taking place, he made his way through the crowd up to the first row where the gypsy girl was, and he stopped behind her. He pressed against her back. The girl tried to separate herself, but José Arcadio pressed more strongly against her back. Then she felt him. She remained motionless against him, trembling with surprise and fear, unable to believe the evidence. And finally she turned her head and looked at him with a tremulous smile. At that instant, two gypsies put the snake man into his cage and carried him into the tent. The gypsy who was conducting the show announced, And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to show the terrible test of the woman who must have her head chopped off every night at this time for 150 years as punishment for having seen what she should not have. José Arcadio and the gypsy girl did not witness the decapitation. They went to her tent, where they kissed each other with a desperate anxiety while they took off their clothes. The gypsy girl removed the starched lace corsets she had on, and there she was, changed into practically nothing. She was a languid little frog, with incipient breasts and legs so thin that they did not even match the size of José Arcadio's arms. But she had a decision and a warmth that compensated for her fragility. Nevertheless, José Arcadio could not respond to her because they were in a kind of public tent where the gypsies passed through with their circus things and did their business and would even tarry by the bed for a game of dice. The lamp hanging from the centre pole lighted the whole place up. During a pause in the caresses, José Arcadio stretched out naked on the bed without knowing what to do, while the girl tried to inspire him. A gypsy woman with splendid flesh came in a short time after, accompanied by a man who was not of the caravan, but who was not from the village either, and they both began to undress in front of the bed. Without meaning to, the woman looked at José Arcadio and examined his magnificent animal in repose with a kind of pathetic fervour. My boy, she exclaimed, may God preserve you just as you are. José Arcadio's companion asked them to leave them alone and the couple lay down on the ground close to the bed. The passion of the others woke up José Arcadio's fervour. On the first contact, the bones of the girl seemed to become disjointed with a disorderly crunch, like the sound of a box of dominoes, and her skin broke out into a pale sweat, and her eyes filled with tears as her whole body exhaled a lugubrious lament and a vague smell of mud. But she bore the impact with a firmness of character and a bravery that were admirable. José Arcadio felt himself lifted up into the air towards a state of seraphic inspiration, where his heart burst forth with an outpouring of tender obscenities that entered the girl through her ears and came out of her mouth translated into her language. It was Thursday. On Saturday night, José Arcadio wrapped a red cloth around his head and left with the gypsies. When Ursula discovered his absence, she searched for him all through the village. In the remains of the gypsy camp, there was nothing but a garbage pit among the still-smoking ashes of the extinguished campfires. Someone who was there looking for beads among the trash 
told Ursula that the night before he had seen her son in the tumult of the caravan pushing the snake man's cage on a cart. He's become a gypsy, she shouted at her husband, who had not shown the slightest sign of alarm over the disappearance. I hope it's true, Jose Arcadio Buendia said, grinding in his mortar the material that had been ground a thousand times and reheated and ground again. That way he'll learn to be a man. Ursula asked where the gypsy had gone. She went along, asking and following the road she had been shown, thinking that she still had time to catch up to them. She kept getting farther away from the village, until she felt so far away that she didn't think about returning. Jose Arcadio Buendia did not discover that his wife was missing until eight o'clock at night, when he left the material warming in a bed of manure, and went to see what was wrong with little Amaranta, who was getting hoarse from crying. In a few hours, he gathered a group of well-equipped men, put Amaranta in the hands of a woman who offered to nurse her, and was lost on invisible paths in pursuit of Ursula. Aureliano went with them. Some Indian fishermen, whose language they couldn't understand, told them with signs that they had not seen anyone pass. After three days of useless searching, they returned to the village. For several weeks, Jose Arcadio Buendia let himself be overcome by consternation. He took care of little Amaranta like a mother. He bathed and dressed her, took her to be nursed four times a day, and even sang to her at night the songs that Ursula never knew how to sing. On a certain occasion, Pilar Ternera volunteered to do the household chores until Ursula came back. Aureliano, whose mysterious intuition had become sharpened with the misfortune, felt a glow of clairvoyance when he saw her come in. Then he knew that in some inexplicable way she was to blame for his brother's flight and the consequent disappearance of his mother, and he harassed her with a silent and implacable hostility in such a way that the woman did not return to the house. Time put things in their place. Jose Arcadio Buendia and his son did not know exactly when they returned to the laboratory, dusting things, lighting the water pipe, involved once more in the patient manipulation of the material that had been sleeping for several months in its bed of manure. Even Amaranta, lying in a wicker basket, observed with curiosity the absorbing work of her father and her brother in the small room where the air was rarefied by mercury vapours. On a certain occasion, months after Ursula's departure, strange things began to happen. An empty flask that had been forgotten in a cupboard for a long time became so heavy that it could not be moved. A pan of water on the work table boiled without any fire under it for a half hour until it completely evaporated. Jose Arcadio Buendia and his son observed those phenomena with startled excitement, unable to explain them but interpreting them as predictions of the material. One day, Amaranta's basket began to move by itself and made a complete turn about the room to the consternation of Aureliano, who hurried to stop it. But his father didn't get upset. He put the basket in its place and tied it to the leg of a table, convinced that the long-awaited event was imminent. It was on that occasion that Aureliano heard him say, If you don't fear God, fear him through the metals. Suddenly, Almost five months after her disappearance, Ursula came back. She arrived exalted, rejuvenated, with new clothes in a style that was unknown in the village. Jose Arcadio Buendia could barely stand up under the impact. That was it, he shouted. I knew it was going to happen. And he really believed it. For during his prolonged imprisonment, as he manipulated the material, he begged in the depth of his heart that the longed-for miracle should not be the discovery of the Philosopher's Stone, 
or the freeing of the breath that makes metals live, or the faculty to convert the hinges and the locks of the house into gold. But what had just happened? Ursula's return. But she did not share his excitement. She gave him a conventional kiss, as if she had been away only an hour, and she told him, Look out the door. Jose Arcadio Buendia took a long time to get out of his perplexity when he went out into the street and saw the crowd. They were not gypsies. They were men and women like them, with straight hair and dark skin, who spoke the same language and complained of the same pains. They had mules loaded down with things to eat, ox carts with furniture and domestic utensils, pure and simple earthly accessories put on sale without any fuss by peddlers of everyday reality. They came from the other side of the swamp, only two days away, where there were towns that received mail every month in the year and where they were familiar with the implements of good living. Ursula had not caught up with the gypsies, but she had found the route that her husband had been unable to discover in his frustrated search for the great inventions. Pilar Ternera's son was brought to his grandparents' house two weeks after he was born. Ursula admitted him grudgingly, conquered once more by the obstinacy of her husband, who could not tolerate the idea that an offshoot of his blood should be adrift, but he imposed the condition that the child should never know his true identity. Although he was given the name José Arcadio, they ended up calling him simply Arcadio, so, so as to avoid confusion. At that time, there was so much activity in the town and so much bustle in the house that the care of the children was relegated to a secondary level. They were put in the care of Visitación, a Guajiro Indian woman who had arrived in town with a brother in flight from a plague of insomnia that had been scourging their tribe for several years. They were both so docile and willing to help that Ursula took them on to help her with the household chores. That was how Arcadio and Amaranta came to speak the Guajiro language before Spanish, and they learned to drink lizard broth and eat spider eggs without Ursula's knowing it, for she was too busy with a promising business in candy animals. Maconda had changed. The people who had come with Ursula spread the news of the good quality of its soil and its privileged position with respect to the swamp, so that from the narrow village of past times it changed into an active town with stores and workshops and a permanent commercial route over which the first Arabs arrived with their baggy pants and rings in their ears, swapping glass beads for macaws. José Arcadio Buendía didn't have a moment's rest. Fascinated by an immediate reality that came to be more fantastic than the vast universe of his imagination, he lost all interest in the alchemist's laboratory, put to rest the material that had become attenuated with months of manipulation, and went back to being the enterprising man of earlier days, when he had decided upon the layout of the streets and the location of the new houses so that no one would enjoy privileges that everyone did not have. He acquired such authority among the new arrivals that foundations were not laid or walls built without his being consulted, and it was decided that he should be the one in charge of the distribution of the land. When the acrobat gypsies returned, with their vagabond carnival transformed now into a gigantic organisation of games of luck and chance, they were received with great joy, for it was thought that José Arcadio would be coming back with them. But José Arcadio did not return, nor did they come with the snake man, who, according to what Ursula thought, was the only one who could tell them about their son. So the gypsies were not allowed to camp in town or set foot in it in the future, for they were considered the bearers of concupiscence and perversion. José Arcadio Buendía, however, 
was explicit in maintaining that the old tribe of Melchiadesh, who had contributed so much to the growth of the village with his age-old wisdom and his fabulous inventions, would always find the gates open. But Melchiadesh tribe, according to what the wanderers said, had been wiped off the face of the earth because they had gone beyond the limits of human knowledge. Emancipated for the moment at least from the torment of fantasy, José Arcadio Buendía in a short time set up a system of order and work which allowed for only one bit of license, the freeing of the birds, which, since the time of the founding, had made time merry with their flutes, and installing in their place musical clocks in every house. They were wondrous clocks, made of carved wood, which the Arabs had traded for macaws, and which José Arcadio Buendía had synchronised with such precision that every half hour the town grew merry with the progressive chords of the same song, until it reached the climax of a noontime that was as exact and unanimous as a complete waltz. It was also José Arcadio Buendía who decided during those years that they should plant almond trees instead of acacias on the streets, and who discovered, without ever revealing it, a way to make them live forever. Many years later, when Macondo was a field of wooden houses with zinc roofs, the broken and dusty almond trees still stood on the oldest streets, although no one knew who had planted them. While his father was putting the town in order, and his mother was increasing their wealth with her marvellous business of candied little roosters and fish, which left the house twice a day strung along sticks of balsa wood, Aureliano spent interminable hours in the abandoned laboratory, learning the art of silver work by his own experimentation. He had shot up so fast that in a short time the clothing left behind by his brother no longer fit him, and he began to wear his father's. But Visitation had to sew pleats in the shirts and darts in the pants, because Aureliano had not acquired the corpulence of the others. Adolescence had taken away the softness of his voice, and had made him silent and definitely solitary. But on the other hand, it had restored the intense expression that he had had in his eyes when he was born. He concentrated so much on his experiments in silver works that he scarcely left the laboratory to eat. Worried over his inner withdrawal, José Arcadio Buendía gave him the keys to the house and a little money, thinking that perhaps he needed a woman. But Aureliano spent the money on muriatic acid to prepare some aqua regia, and he beautified the keys by plating them with gold. His excesses were hardly comparable to those of Arcadio and Amaranta, who had already begun to get their second teeth, and still went about all day clutching at the Indians' cloaks, stubborn in their decision not to speak Spanish, but the Guajiro language. You shouldn't complain, Ursula told her husband. Children inherit their parents' madness. And, as she was lamenting her misfortune, convinced that the wild behaviour of her children was something as fearful as a pig's tail, Aureliano gave her a look that wrapped her in an atmosphere of uncertainty. Somebody is coming, he told her. Ursula, as she did whenever he made a prediction, tried to break it down with her housewifely logic. It was normal for someone to be coming. Dozens of strangers came through Macondo every day without arousing suspicion or secret ideas. Nevertheless, beyond all logic, Aureliano was sure of his prediction. I don't know who it will be, he insisted, but whoever it is is already on the way. That Sunday, in fact, Rebecca arrived. She was only eleven years old. She had made the difficult trip from Manaure with some hide dealers who had taken on the task of delivering her along with a letter to José Arcadio Buendía. But they could not explain precisely who the person was who had asked the favour. Her entire baggage consisted of a small trunk, a little rocking chair with small hand-painted flowers, 
and a canvas sack which kept making a clock-clock-clock sound where she carried her parents' bones. The letter, addressed to José Arcadio Buendía, was written in very warm terms by someone who still loved him very much, in spite of time and distance, and who felt obliged by a basic humanitarian feeling to do the charitable thing and sent him that poor, unsheltered orphan who was a second cousin of Ursula's and consequently also a relative of José Arcadio Buendía, although farther removed, because she was the daughter of that unforgettable friend Nicanor Uloa and his very worthy wife Rebecca Montiel, May God keep them in his holy kingdom, whose remains the girl was carrying so that they might be given Christian burial. The names mentioned, as well as the signature on the letter, were perfectly legible, but neither José Arcadio Buendía nor Ursula remembered having any relatives with those names, nor did they know anyone by the name of the sender of the letter, much less the remote village of Manaure. It was impossible to obtain any further information from the girl. From the moment she arrived, she had been sitting in the rocker, sucking her finger, and observing everyone with her large, startled eyes, without giving any sign of understanding what they were asking her. She wore a diagonally striped dress that had been dyed black, worn by use, and a pair of scaly patent leather boots. Her hair was held behind her ears with bows of black ribbon. She wore a scapular with the images worn away by sweat, and on her right wrist the fang of a carnivorous animal mounted on the backing of copper as an amulet against the evil eye. Her greenish skin, her stomach, round and tense as a drum, revealed poor health and hunger that were older than she was. But when they gave her something to eat, she kept the plate on her knees without tasting anything. They even began to think that she was a deaf mute, until the Indians asked her in their language if she wanted some water, and she moved her eyes as if she recognised them, and said yes with her head. They kept her, because there was nothing else they could do. They decided to call her Rebecca, which, according to the letter, was her mother's name, because Aureliano had the patience to read to her the names of all the saints, and he didn't get a reaction from any one of them. Since there was no cemetery in Macondo at that time, for no one had died up till then, they kept the bag of bones to wait for a worthy place of burial. And for a long time it got in the way everywhere, and would be found where least expected, always with its clucking of a broody hen. A long time passed before Rebecca became incorporated into the life of the family. She would sit in her small rocker, sucking her finger, in the most remote corner of the house. Nothing attracted her attention except the music of the clocks, which she would look for every half hour with her frightened eyes, as if she hoped to find it some place in the air. They could not get her to eat for several days. No one understood why she had not died of hunger until the Indians, who were aware of everything, for they went ceaselessly about the house on their stealthy feet, discovered that Rebecca only liked to eat the damp earth of the courtyard and the cake of whitewash that she picked off the walls with her nails. It was obvious that her parents, or whoever had raised her, had scolded her for that habit, because she did it secretively and with a feeling of guilt, trying to put away supplies so that she could eat when no one was looking. From then on, they put her under an implacable watch. They threw cow gall onto the courtyard and rubbed hot chilli on the walls, thinking they could defeat her pernicious vice with those methods. But she showed such signs of astuteness and ingenuity to find some earth that Ursula found herself forced to use more drastic methods. She put some orange juice and rhubarb into a pan that she left in the dew all night, and she gave her the dose the following day on an empty stomach. Although no one had told her that it was the specific remedy for the vice of eating earth, she thought that any bitter substance in an empty stomach would have to make the liver react. Rebecca was so rebellious and strong 
in spite of her frailness, that they had to tie her up like a calf to make her swallow the medicine, and they could barely keep back her kicks or bear up under the strange hieroglyphics that she alternated with her bites and spitting, and that, according to what the scandalised Indians said, were the vilest obscenities that one could ever imagine in their language. When Ursula discovered that, she added whipping to the treatment. It was never established whether it was the rhubarb or the beatings that had effect, or both of them together, but the truth was that in a few weeks Rebecca began to show signs of recovery. She took part in the games of Arcadio and Amaranta, who treated her like an older sister, and she ate heartily, using the utensils properly. It was soon revealed that she spoke Spanish with as much fluency as the Indian language, that she had a remarkable ability for manual work, and that she could sing the waltz of the clocks with some very funny words that she herself had invented. It didn't take long for them to discover her another member of the family. She was more affectionate to Ursula than any of her own children had been, and she called Arcadio and Amaranta brother and sister, Aureliano, uncle, and José Arcadio Buendía, grandpa. So that she finally deserved, as much as the others, the name of Rebecca Buendía, the only one that she ever had, and that she bore with dignity until her death. One night, about the time that Rebecca was cured of the vice of eating earth and was brought to sleep in the other children's room, the Indian woman, who slept with them, awoke by chance and heard a strange intermittent sound in the corner. She got up in alarm, thinking that an animal had come into the room. And then she saw Rebecca in the rocker, sucking her finger and with her eyes lighted up in the darkness like those of a cat. Terrified, Exhausted by her fate, Visitation recognised in those eyes the symptoms of the sickness whose threat had obliged her and her brother to exile themselves forever from an age-old kingdom where they had been prince and princess. It was the insomnia plague. Kataure, the Indian, was gone from the house by morning. His sister stayed because her fatalistic heart told her that the lethal sickness would follow her, no matter what, to the farthest corner of the earth. No one understood Visitation's alarm. If we don't ever sleep again, so much the better, José Arcadio Buendía said in good humour. That way we can get more out of life. But the Indian woman explained that the most fearsome part of the sickness of insomnia was not the impossibility of sleeping, for the body didn't feel any fatigue at all, but its inexorable evolution toward a more critical manifestation, a loss of memory. She meant that when the sick person became used to his state of vigil, the recollection of his childhood began to be erased from his memory. Then the name and notion of things, and finally the identity of people, and even the awareness of his own being, until he sank into a kind of idiocy that had no past. José Arcadio Buendía, dying with laughter, thought that it was just a question of one of the many illnesses invented by the Indian superstitions. But Ursula, just to be safe, took the precaution of isolating Rebecca from the other children. After several weeks... When Visitation's terror seemed to have died down, José Arcadio Buendía found himself rolling over in bed, unable to fall asleep. Ursula, who had also awakened, asked him what was wrong, and he answered, I'm thinking about Prudencio Arguila again. They did not sleep a minute, but the following day they felt so rested that they forgot about the bad night. Aureliano commented with surprise at lunchtime that he felt very well, in spite of the fact that he had spent the whole night in the laboratory gilding a brooch that he planned to give to Ursula for her birthday. They did not become alarmed until the third day, when no one felt sleepy at bedtime, and they realised that they had gone more than fifty hours without sleeping. The children are awake too, the Indian said with her 
fatalistic conviction. Once it gets into a house, no one can escape the plague. They had indeed contracted the illness of insomnia. Ursula, who had learned from her mother the medicinal value of plants, prepared and made them all drink a brew of monkshood. But they could not get to sleep and spent the whole day dreaming on their feet. In that state of hallucinated lucidity, not only did they see the images of their own dreams, but some saw the images dreamed by others. It was as if the house were full of visitors. Sitting in her rocker in a corner of the kitchen, Rebecca dreamed that a man, who looked very much like her, dressed in white linen and with his shirt collar closed by a gold button, was bringing her a bouquet of roses. He was accompanied by a woman with delicate hands who took out one rose and put it in the child's hair. Ursula understood that the man and woman were Rebecca's parents, but even though she made a great effort to recognise them, she confirmed her certainty that she had never seen them. In the meantime, through an oversight that José Arcadio Buendía never forgave himself for, the candy animals made in the house were still being sold in the town. Children and adults sucked with delight on the delicious little green roosters of insomnia the exquisite pink fish of insomnia and the tender yellow ponies of insomnia, so that dawn on Monday found the whole town awake. No one was alarmed at first. On the contrary, they were happy at not sleeping because there was so much to do in Macondo in those days that there was barely enough time. They worked so hard that soon they had nothing else to do, and they could be found at three o'clock in the morning with their arms crossed, counting the notes in the waltz of the clock. Those who wanted to sleep, not from fatigue, but because of the nostalgia for dreams, tried all kinds of methods of exhausting themselves. They would gather together to converse endlessly, to tell over and over, for hours on end, the same jokes, to complicate to the limits of exasperation a story about the capon, which was an endless game in which the narrator asked if they wanted him to tell them the story about the capon, and when they answered yes, the narrator would say that he had not asked them to say yes, but whether they wanted him to tell them the story about the capon. And when they said no, the narrator told them that he had not asked them to say no, but whether they wanted him to tell them the story about the capon. And when they remained silent, the narrator told them that he had not asked them to remain silent, but whether they wanted him to tell them the story about the capon. And no one could leave because the narrator would say that he had not asked them to leave, but whether they wanted him to tell them the story about the capon, and so on and on, in a vicious circle that lasted entire nights. When José Arcadio Buendía realised that the plague had invaded the town, he gathered together the heads of families to explain to them what he knew about the sickness of insomnia, and they agreed on methods to prevent the scourge from spreading to other towns in the swamp. That was why they took the bells off the goats, bells that the Arabs had swapped them for macaws, and put them at the entrance to town at the disposal of those who would not listen to the advice and entreaties of the sentinels, and insisted on visiting the town. All strangers who passed through the streets of Macondo at that time had to ring their bells so that the sick people would know that they were healthy. They were not allowed to eat or drink anything during their stay, for there was no doubt but that the illness was transmitted by mouth, and all food and drink had been contaminated by insomnia. In that way, they kept the plague restricted to the perimeter of the town. So effective was the quarantine that the day came when the emergency situation was accepted as a natural thing, and life was organised in such a way that work picked up its rhythm again, and no one worried any more about the useless habit of sleeping. It was Aureliano who conceived the formula that was to protect them against loss of memory for several months. He discovered it by chance. An expert insomniac, having been one of the first, he had learned the art of silverwork to perfection. 
One day, he was looking for the small anvil that he used for laminating metals, and he could not remember its name. His father told him, Stake. Aureliano wrote the name on a piece of paper that he pasted to the base of the small anvil. Stake. In that way, he was sure of not forgetting it in the future. It did not occur to him that this was the first manifestation of a loss of memory, because the object had a difficult name to remember. But a few days later, he discovered that he had trouble remembering almost every object in the laboratory. Then he marked them with their respective names, so that all he had to do was read the inscription in, in order to identify them. When his father told him about his alarm at having forgotten even the most impressive happenings of his childhood, Aureliano explained his method to him, and José Arcadio Buendía put it into practice all through the house, and later on imposed it on the whole village. With an inked brush, he marked everything with its name. Table, chair, clock, door, wall, bed, pan... He went to the corral and marked the animals and plants. Cow, goat, pig, hen, cassava, caladium, banana. Little by little, studying the infinite possibilities of a loss of memory, he realised that the day might come when things would be recognised by their inscriptions, but that no one would remember their use. Then he was more explicit. The sign that he hung on the neck of the cow was an exemplary proof of the way in which the inhabitants of Macondo were prepared to fight against loss of memory. This is the cow. She must be milked every morning so that she will produce milk, and the milk must be boiled in order to be mixed with coffee, to make coffee and milk. Thus they went on living in a reality that was slipping away, momentarily captured by words but which would escape irremediably when they forgot the values of the written letters. At the beginning of the road into the swamp, they put up a sign that said, Macondo, and another larger one on the main street that said, God exists. In all the houses, keys to memorising objects and feelings had been written. But the system demanded so much vigilance and moral strength that many succumbed to the spell of an imaginary reality, one invented by themselves, which was less practical for them but more comforting. Pilar Ternera was the one who contributed most to popularise the mystification when she conceived the trick of reading the past in cards, as she had read the future before. By means of that recourse, the insomniacs began to live in a world built on the uncertain alternatives of the cards, where a father was remembered faintly as the dark man who had arrived at the beginning of April, and a mother was remembered only as the dark woman who wore a gold ring on her left hand, and where a birth date was reduced to the last Tuesday on which a lark sang in the laurel tree. Defeated by those practices of consolation, José Arcadio Buendía then decided to build the memory machine that he had desired once in order to remember the marvellous inventions of the gypsies. The artefact was based on the possibility of reviewing every morning, from beginning to end, the totality of knowledge acquired during one's life. He conceived of it as a spinning dictionary, that a person placed on the axis could operate by means of a lever. So that, in very few hours, there would pass before his eyes the notions most necessary for life. He had succeeded in writing almost 14,000 entries, when along the road from the swamp, a strange-looking old man with the sad sleeper's bell appeared, carrying a bulging suitcase tied with a rope, and pulling a cart covered with black cloth. He went straight to the house of José Arcadio Buendía. Visitación did not recognise him when she opened the door, and she thought he had come with the idea of selling something, 
unaware that nothing could be sold in a town that was sinking irrevocably into the quicksand of forgetfulness. He was a decrepit man. Although his voice was also broken by uncertainty, and his hands seemed to doubt the existence of things, it was evident that he came from the world where men could still sleep and remember. José Arcadio Buendía found him sitting in the living room, fanning himself with a patched black hat, as he read with compassionate attention the signs pasted to the walls. He greeted him with a broad show of affection, afraid that he had known him at another time and that he did not remember him now. But the visitor was aware of his falseness. He felt himself forgotten, not with the irremediable forgetfulness of the heart, but with a different kind of forgetfulness, which was more cruel and irrevocable, and which he knew very well, because it was the forgetfulness of death. Then he understood. He opened the suitcase crammed with indecipherable objects, and from among them he took out a little case with many flasks.